Well, we're going to carry on going through First Peter, and we've got to chapter four. And as we all know, first, uh, uh, you know, well, as we all know, there is a therefore at the start of four. So we have to remember what it's there for. So we look back through what I've said. So I'm going to finish with the roundup that I did from the last, uh, you know, from my last talk, because I rounded up by saying we have to remember ultimately that God is in control of everything that there is, has been, and will be. God is in control, and God can use all things for his glory. Jesus himself has said he has the power, and he has dominion over everything. Just before he got um, took up to heaven again, he says, all authority has been given to me. So that's the joy of the Great Commission that he's given us. All of, all of it's been given to me, so I'm telling you to go. Go and make disciples. So are we fulfilling it? Are we fulfilling the Great Commission? Are we standing righteously before God? In other words, are we in right standing before God? So as God looks at our lives, can he say, you know, can he point anything out that he wouldn't agree with? Can he point anything out to say, that's not from me, that's not what I've given you. That's not, that's not the burdens, that's not the cross that I've given you to bear. That's what we have to remember. And then we have to remember as well is our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against any person. It's not against anybody in this world. It's not against a, a figure. It is against the, the real enemy, that is the devil and the principalities and powers that he's put in place and is using other people to do his bidding, to do his work. So we're never against any evil person, but we're against the evil that is driving that person because we want all people to come to the saving knowledge of God and the hope that he has given us. And Jesus has triumphed over every evil because of what he did. Because of what he did in the cross, he's triumphed over everything. And he has shown us how to do it. He's shown us how to live life every single day, empowered to be him, uh, to be his hands and feet, to be him, really, to everybody that we come in touch, in touch with. So now we have to go and do what he did. We've got to go in the authority he's given us. Because he says, all authority has been given to me, so you go and make disciples. And it starts with, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. So this is First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. So we've got to arm ourselves with the same attitude of Christ. So the obvious question is, what is the attitude of Christ? If we're to have the mind of Christ, if we're to have the same attitude of Christ, what sort of attitude did he have? What mind did he have? And in Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what, he, what they're saying is Jesus came. He had the right to, came, to come as a king, to live as a king and to die as a king and to die spotless. But what did Jesus do? Jesus chose to come and be born into a stable with, with nothing. Then he run off in exile. He, was, he, he basically had to be a refugee. He run off as a refugee, was hiding for his life um, in, in around um, Egypt, and then eventually came back to one of the, one of the slums of the day, in Nazareth. Because they used to say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because it used to be that bad a place. You know, so he, he came, he was that. He was a carpenter's son. He wasn't the king's son. But the thing is, he knew his position. He knew who God had made him to be. So he was happy to be that. Because he came to serve. He didn't come to lord over us. Because, in all honesty, if you, had the, if you, if you could save the whole world, if you, would you not think you're pretty good? I know I would. <laughs> you know, but the thing is, Jesus didn't come to lord it over us. He didn't come to say, you know what, you're wrong. Um, you know, and I've come to make you right. He came and he served and he just knuckled under and he'd done what needed to be done to reach the lowest, to reach the hopeless, to reach the broken, 
to reach those that have no hope because he, wa he wants to be the hope of the world. He even, even allowed himself to be killed so that that could happen. Because it says, uh, it, it goes on to say in the verse, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. Jesus didn't have time for sin. If we look at what, Je uh, what Jesus had to go through, you know he didn't care. Uh, uh, you know, he didn't care about the binds that sin had on people. Because he, he loved those who he wasn't. He spoke to everybody, no matter who there was, no matter who their station was. You know, and he was betrayed by one of his closest because Judas came up to him and gave him a kiss, betraying him so that he could be taken away to the cross. He was taken captive, um, you know, by, by people that had no right to take him because he hadn't done anything to justify being taken captive. He was deserted by all of his friends. Everybody that said that, that just beforehand, you know, one of them said, you know what, I'll die for you, Jesus. He, they run away. You know, everybody run away. Everybody abandoned him. He was falsely accused by those in the crowd. People were making up stuff. So the chief priests were there, um, you know, giving false testimony against Jesus so that they might uh, try and get him put to death. But they couldn't find anyone with a true witness because they could see that it was all false, but they couldn't, do, they, they couldn't do anything about it either. He was spat upon and beat up. And this is all just happening basically in the last night of Jesus' life, let alone the rest of his ministry. You know, they slapped him. They beat, they, they, as they were beating him up, um, they had him uh, blindfolded, and they were like, oh, prophesy who's going to hit you next. Prophesy who's going to hit you next. As they beat him up. He was falsely accused by those in authority. So whenever, you know, so, and he just didn't answer. Because there was no, there was no, there was no reasoning. There was no point. But he just, he just, like a lamb before his shears was done. He just, he just didn't say a word. He was rejected. He was rejected by everyone. So they offered him. The, they offered to the crowd, "You can release this man, Jesus, who's done no wrong to anyone, or you can have this murderer." And the crowd all rejected him and said, "No, give us the murderer." You know, he was scourged. He was he was mocked. They were all kneeling before him, saying, "Oh, heal King of the Jews," mocking him, just basically trying to trying to disrespect his position. He was derided. So people walk by just going, oh, I can't believe that person. And then not only that, he died in the end, just so that we can have that. That's what Jesus did for us. So what can we do for him? You know, how, how are we meant to stand for him? Like, why do we let sin bind us whenever Jesus went through all that because he didn't have sin? You know, just so he could stay in right standing with God. He didn't. He could have called angels to just come and wipe out the whole of humanity, but he didn't. And then it goes on to say, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Because the thing is, we all have a choice. Do we live for ourselves or do we live for what God wants? And that's the, that's the challenge that we face on a minutely basis in our lives. You know, in light of all that Jesus has done for us, why do we worry about just getting a few earthly pleasures or getting a few feel-good factors or a few, you know, a few highs? You know, why do we want some meaningless joy? So, for instance, you know, the, the rugby was today. I was gutted after the rugby. But am I going to let that ruin the rest of my life? No. I'm sorry. It's only a game at the end of the day. You know, sorry, you know, sorry Rob, I know you want to gloat, but it's only a game. You know, it is. So I'm not going to let it ruin who I am and ruin what, you know, what I want to become because of just a few, you know, pleasures. But the thing is, I want to see God's plans and purposes come to pass in this area. You know, I don't know about you, but, you know, as we, you know, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, or as we pray, ever pray, you know, God, we want to see your kingdom come. Do we really mean it? Or are we, going, are we going to get disheartened if it doesn't come? Are you going to allow your heart to break if it doesn't start to come soon? You know, we pray it all the time. God, send your kingdom, you know, you know let, let what you want to happen on earth happen. You know, but are we fighting for it? Are we fighting to see God's kingdom come on earth? You know, do we care if God doesn't show up? That's a big, that's a big question. So what if we come here one Sunday morning and God doesn't show up? Or some, one Sunday night and God doesn't show up? Are we going to care? Or are we just going to, you know, carry on? Because there's, um, whenever, the, um, whenever the ark was took out of, um, the, 
out of the temple. It was, it was took away out of the temple. And the priests that were there carried on as if it was out of the temple. God's presence had already left because it went with the ark wherever the ark went. That was God's presence with his people and it had been stole away. But the thing is, the priest carried on as if it was there. So the, the challenge comes, like if, if we see God stopping moving in our meetings, are we going to get concerned? Because the joy is, uh, over the past months, we've seen God moving in ways in our meeting that we, we've been like, oh, God showed up, God showed up, it's brilliant, and we come, we're coming expectant. But if God, you know, if, if we feel God's presence lifting away from our meetings, are we going to are we going to call back God back into our meetings? Are we going to work out why has God stopped showing up, and what can we do to bring that back? We have to. We have to. Because it says, for you spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, uh, carousing, uh, and detestable idolatry. So if we think back, um, you know, on how much time and effort we've wasted in things that are meaningless, things that aren't in the will of God, things that aren't God's plan for our lives, you know, we can have a long list. You know, so, you know, we can always think and we can always like, go, if I only had a better car or if I only had a better house, if I only had um, the newest clothes or, you know, if only had that girlfriend, you know, I, I know I wasted so much time chasing girls whenever I was growing up because I always wanted the girl, you know, that hot girl. You know, we always wanted them. You know, if, if we want that little bit of pleasure that a few drinks gives us or whatever else that we seek our pleasure in, if only I had dot, 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 I'm sure we all could say something from our own lives that we all, we all have thought and all have made of more importance than God at some point. We've all had it. We've all been there. We've all put something above God, whether that's money, house, you know, partners, whatever it is, you know, more and more and more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we always want it because that's what our culture and society is saying we should have. You know, you should have the biggest house. You should have that. So you've been doing this for a while, so therefore you should be doing that. You know, so like I know a lot of, a lot of youth pastors get all the time is you've been working with the youth for so many years, but now you're going to get an upgrade to, um, you know, to adults. You know, are you going to move across to adults? You know, and it's like, well, they're all people. There's no difference, you know. <laughs> Like, you know, so at the end of the day, you know, people are people, you know, so like, so are we going to live by what the world standards and what the world deems as progress? Or are we going to read what God says? And are we going to do what he says? Because in Matthew 6, he says, don't store up yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves can break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. So where are you pouring your time and your effort and, and even your money and, you know, everything that you have, what are you pouring it into? Are you trying to make a wee nest egg, you know, or are you trying to invest it in the kingdom of God and going, God, what do I have to do to get your kingdom to come? What do I have to do? How much time do I have to spend on my knees? How much, you know, effort do I have to put in with my neighbors to see them come to saving faith in you? You know, how much, how much do I need to do to actually see you come on this earth? Because it goes on to say, they are surprised that you do not want to join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. You're going to get abuse if you stand up and are different from what society says you should be. So years ago, it was all about being an individual. You know, everybody must be an individual. That's what our culture was saying. Everybody has to be, you know, you have to be exactly who you are, who you're made to be. And now it's all about, why aren't you fitting in? Why aren't you in, the, you know, why aren't you fitting in? You know, why are you, why are you being different? You know, why are you standing out? You know, so whatever, wherever we are in that extreme, whenever we look at the Bible and then, you know, gauge our lives from what the Bible says, are we actually, you know, are we actually standing out for God? You know, compared to earth standards to God's standards? Or are we basically just trying to blend in and not cause a ruckus? So we're going to, whenever people look at us, they're going to see something different. They're going to see people that are satisfied, you know, without getting that brand new car every three years on your, on your you know, your debt covered deals. You know, are we going to be satisfied with whatever it is? You know, and then why do we have a peace whenever it seems to be a storm raging all around us? So no matter what we go through in life, are we going to have a peace? Are we going to have the peace knowing 
God's got me. I, I'm walking in the center of God's will because we're his sheep, so we hear his voice. So therefore, we can walk in the center of God's will because as we listen to God's voice, each and every single one of us, we can then walk in the center of his will for our lives. So we can walk in the peace and the knowledge that God's guiding our footsteps. So we don't need to get worried whenever that illness comes. We don't need to get worried whenever we lose jobs, whenever we um, lose money, whenever we, you know, whatever it is. You know, we can have a peace through it all. Because we don't need that high. We don't need that feel-good factor. We don't need to trust our feelings. We can trust in the truth of what God has said over us and said about our lives. Because if you go in your feelings, you're going to be on a roller coaster ride for the rest of your life. It's true. You know, if, if we look at the, uh, you know, if I just look back over the past two weeks, like my feelings have been such a roller coaster. And it's like, whoa, where did all these come from? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it doesn't matter. Because I know who I've believed in. And I know he's got me. And I know, like, he'll keep what I've committed to him to that day whenever I get to go to heaven. And that's the beauty of it. We don't need to trust in that. You know, so whenever we make a stand up, whenever we follow God's word and actually don't sleep around and actually save ourselves till marriage to invest in that one that we've got, whenever we um, don't go out and get drunk to try and find our meaning in the bottom of a bottle, whenever we don't go out and um, spend all our money for things that we don't really need, for prices we don't really want to pay, you know, that's the beauty of it. We don't need to live under them. Because it goes on and it says, but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. We all have to give account for every action and everything that we do. We don't get away with anything. Nobody in this world will get away with anything because we will all have to give account for every action. And that's a, sc- that's a scary bit. You know, so you, you think about over every, every time you overreacted or every time you've you know, even underreacted. You know, every time, everything that you have done or haven't done you know, you're going to have to have a, give account as to why you did or did not do that. You know, and that's a scary thought. But the beauty of it is, for this reason, the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. So, yes, we will have to give account for all of our physical, what we have and haven't done. But ultimately, this flesh will fail. Ultimately, um, we're not going to get it right all the time, and we will have to give account. But everybody, and even everybody in the past that has passed on, is going to be judged. Everybody throughout the whole of history is going to be judged by God. But we will be judged by our physical actions, but more than that, we'll be judged according to our relationship with God. So how much was our spirit open to God's spirit, and how much do we follow God's leading? How much of God's will for our lives are we living out? That's what that verse is challenging us to do. Are you living out God's will for your life? Or are you hiding behind some insecurities? Or hiding behind some, um, you know, oh, if only I had a bit more strength, or if only I had, or if only I could, or if only... Because we'll never get it if we always live behind or with only, or our if onlys. In the end of, in the, sorry, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. We don't have long left on this earth. You know, we hear it preached all the time. We don't have long left. You know, Jesus is coming back. So look around. Look around us. What, what can you see? You know, you see a world out there with no hope. Or what hope are we taking them? What are, what are you taking to the world out there? That's the challenge. Or are we trying to hide and not take them the hope that we have? Or are we trying to wait until they come in the door and then we can give them something? You know, because the, the beauty of what we have is, it's to be spread by every single one of us. Because I might see, what, a thousand people a week. Steve might see, see a couple of hundred people a week. Or, you know, it depends on any funerals he does and stuff, uh, and stuff. You know, but that's only so much. You know, preaching from the front here can only do so much. But collectively, in this room, I'd say we probably meet, I'd say, upwards of a hundred thousand people a week between all of our jobs and everything that we do, even going to the shops and everything we do, we reach such a large number of people. So why can't you, why, why, why can't you be a spreader of the hope that God's given you through that 100,000 people? Why, can, you know, why can't we be astonished by what God does just by us living our lives, 
fully devoted to him. You know, because the end is near. So, you know, what it says is, you know, be of sober uh, and of sober mind so that you may pray. What it's saying is, don't get distracted. It's not just about you know, not going out and getting drunk, that verse. What it's saying is, look, keep your mind on the ground. Keep your mind in the moment, in every single moment. You know, don't be trying to forget your troubles and don't be trying to run away from what, uh, what you think you have to run away from, but stand firm in God. And then you'll see with a sober mind, with a mind that's ground, firmly grounded in the truth of God, you'll see what God wants to show you and you'll be a response to that. Because as you pray, God, God will make you the answer to your prayers. Believe it or believe it not, you are the answer to most of your prayers. That's the beauty of our prayers. So we need to get on our knees and we need to push into God so that we can be the answer to them. And above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. And the beauty of this verse is we're all going to get it wrong at times. I'm going to hurt people at times. But the thing is, if I truly love someone, you know, and, I, and if they truly, you know, love me, then they'll forgive me for my mishaps. You know, if we truly love each other, we'll forgive each other when we don't get it right. When we, and we won't hold people ransom when they don't get it right. We won't say, oh, this is a disgrace. I can't believe that happened. You know, what we can do is we can pull alongside them in love and go, oh, I can't believe that happened. Okay, what do we need to learn and how do we move forward? And then, because that love, if you truly love someone, you want what's best for them. You don't want to see them destroyed. You want to, you know, whenever they're pressed, well, whenever they're pressed, they won't be crushed. They won't be overcome by, by mistakes. Because too many people live under the guilt of mistakes. You know, we can't change the past. We can learn from the past and move on. And that's the beauty of it. So whether, whatever, whether a mistake was accidental or on purpose, we need to love each other. We need to forgive each other. You know, obviously with, rep with, with repentance for wrongdoing. And then we go on to offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Because if you've got something and you can look after someone, why would you not? Why would you not care for someone? You know, so, you know, if you've got something, give it away. You know, if, if somebody needs that something you've got, give it to them. That's the beauty of it. You know, the Acts 2, you talked about the believers having everything in common and just, you know, everybody give to everybody as they had need. You know, so, you know, so if somebody needs to borrow this iPad at some times to do something, that's fine. I'm all right with that. It's only an iPad. You know, that's the beauty. Of, that's how we should view everything that we have. You know, because God's blessed us with it, so let's bless others. Or are we just going to let it be an inconvenience? Oh, I can't believe they want that. Uh, will they ever see it again? You know, it's a challenge. You know, and then each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So are you using the gifts that God has given you? So this is more looking at each and every single person now, not so much the physical stuff that we have, but each and every single person. Are you using the gifts that God's given you? Everybody in this room has gifts. And I bet you, if I went around and asked your friends what your gifts were, they could probably tell you better than you. Because most people don't realize the gifts that they do have. You know, and that's the beauty of it. You know, so if you don't know your gifts, ask your friends, you know, what am I good at? You know, because you, know, you, might, you might be really good at making someone a cup of tea and just sitting down there and listening to them. And that's a big gift from God because some people can't do that. You know, some people are just, you know, are brilliant at just really lifting the spirit when they walk into their room. So they're just full of life and they can actually, they carry the life of God in them. And um, so like if there's a, you know, oppressive spirit in a room, whenever they walk in, it lights up. You know, what gifts do you have that basically transforms the atmospheres that you're in? And then whenever you apply them gifts, are we looking to apply them not just here, not just in different things, but everywhere we go. I love the reading club. And I didn't tell Judith I was going to do this, but I love seeing Judith in the reading club. Because Judith, Judith comes alive whenever she's sitting with someone, and she's just going, going through read, you know, reading, reading a book through with someone. And then you can just, you can just see her you know, really investing in that kid, just helping them read, helping to teach them how to read. That transforms things. That transforms people. You know, sorry, Judith, for picking you out without telling you, but... Yeah, but, it's, you know, 
That's, we need to honor people with the gifts as they apply them and use them. It's beautiful. So are you applying the gifts God's given you? It's a challenge we all need to constantly ask ourselves. What, what do I have and what can I give and where can I give it? You know, it doesn't have to be a big thing. You know, it can be something as small and simple as that. And then if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Like it's always our heart whenever we get up here to share with you um, on Sunday mornings or nights or Thursdays at the Bible studies or any time we get up to share. It's always our hearts that we would share the very words of God into each other's, uh, into, into our lives. I'm sure every preacher that stood here would stand up and say that. But the joy is, this verse isn't about public preaching. This verse is actually about every single day life. Every single conversation you have, every single word you speak in and around work and play and everywhere you go, is it speaking the words of God into everybody's life around you? You know, are you speaking life? Or are you just joining in with the crowd? Are you speaking what God wants into every single situation? So if somebody shares how they're struggling with something, are you building them up and encouraging them and just um, spurring them on to become the person they're meant to be? You know, no matter who they are, no matter where they are. That's the beauty of that verse. The beauty of that verse is basically we can all rise to it. And another good thing which God says is, if you don't know what to say, ask me and I'll tell you what to say. Because in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, he says, Call unto me, and I will answer, and tell you great and unsearchable things you don't know. So if you're, if you're sitting listening to someone, and they're sharing a heartbreak, and you don't know what to say in response, pray that verse. God, you said, if I call to you, you'll answer and tell me unsearchable, great and unsearchable things I don't know. So God, give me an insight into this person's life, so then you can then prophesy. That's as, that's as simple as prophecy is, just basically speaking God's words over someone. And that's just part, that's to be part of our every single day conversation in life. It's not to be something extra, extraordinary. It's just to be God speaking, and, and we're to be God's voice. That's the beauty of what God says. And if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Christ Jesus. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So if you're going to serve God, if you're going to speak God's word, we need to do it in his strength. We need to do it in the strength he gives us because the thing is, if we try to do it in our own strength, I'm sure we've all been there. If you try to do something, you'll try, you'll try, you'll try. You'll do it for a short while, but then you'll fall flat in your face and things will go wrong. But whenever we do it in God's power and God's strength, then we can just rest and relax into that. We don't need to get uptight. We don't need to get worried, especially whenever um, stuff comes against us, whenever stuff goes wrong. We don't need to get anxious. But we can just trust God and trust the strength that he gives us so that God may be praised through Christ Jesus. That's the key to that verse. That unlocks everything because it's all for God's glory. Everything we do is for God's glory. Even everything we don't do should be for God's glory. So if you're not going to do something, make sure it's for God's glory and not just because you don't want to do it. And that's the challenge. That's, that's what God gives us. That's why whenever, we, uh, whenever you know, we serve as a church, whenever whatever we do, wherever we are, we can be God's hands and feet. You can be the response to the world. So we, we don't need to speak from our own experience or we don't need to speak for what we know. Yes, that helps us along the journey sometimes, but sometimes it can distract us. We need to speak from what God says. And we need to speak God's life and God's word over people. We don't need to serve from our own strength because we'll get drained, we'll get tired, we'll worry, we'll get anxious, and everything that we shouldn't be. We should serve from God's strength and then walk in his peace. So after doing everything to stand, we can then stand. So how often are we speaking, speaking God's words? And how often do we rely on his strength? Because strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. And that's the beauty of where I want to leave it. Because whenever we wait on God, whatever our worries, whatever our fears, whatever it is that holds us back, it all fades away to nothing. Because whenever we look at what Jesus had to go through, we go back to the start, what did Jesus have to go through? Jesus went through everything so that we can be reunited with a God that loves us. And in light of that, we can serve the world. Amen. Yeah.